welcome one and all to another Hoops and Dreams uh, QPR preview podcast. My name is Brian Fisher and I'll be hosting the previews for almost all of the midweek games. Um, the only ones I'm going to miss will be the ones where I'll be enjoying the sun somewhere. Um, to help me get through this season will be someone who you should by now, won't, well, should know him well. Uh, George Sharp, a very warm welcome to you, George. Thank you, Brian. And thanks for inviting me back this year. It's a pleasure to be on for these um, preview shows. Uh, viewers may realise my backdrop isn't as impressive today. Um, I am away at my caravan, so this is the best you could get. <laughs> yeah, the only caravan I know used to play uh, heavy rock. But anyway, um, in, this, in this episode, we'll be previewing, previewing the uh, EFL Cup match against uh, Cambridge United. But first, we should try to review the last game played by the R's, um, which was at home against West Bromwich Albion. Uh, we went into this opening fixture knowing that QPR had uh, won only one of the last 10 meetings between the two sides. Um, when we secured, well, sorry, when we scored after only 16 minutes, uh, I, I thought, wow, this is looking good. Um, but the baggies equalised within 10 minutes uh, through Mayer who then went on to, in a determined push, to uh, score twice more uh, in the second half with two more breakaway goals. Um, and that gave him a hat-trick. And the R's, a very sound defeat, I'm sorry to say. Um, so, George, was this the result and performance you were expecting? Um, well, you look at the pre-season games building up to it, you wouldn't be too surprised looking at the result. But obviously, starting off the game so well, you would the positivity around the place. Great ball in from Colley for the goal, by the way. Um, yeah. But no, it was just we went a bit passive after scoring, didn't we? And it was just poor, poor marking, poor defending for the three goals, which were all of a similar ilk, really. Yeah. All very similar goals. And yeah, it's quite weird because going into the game, I was like, oh, there won't be many goals. Our defence is quite solid. But it turns out we conceded three which is the complete opposite to what I thought. So I think that proves my point that you can never predict QPR, especially on opening game of the season. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you on that. My prediction was a 1-0 win for us, so that was no good at all. Uh, and I think probably Mayer thought, you know, well, look, I scored like this uh, for the first goal. Why don't I keep repeating it and see what happens? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what that tells us about our defence, which, you know, like you, I thought was pretty good up until then. Um, but there we go. Uh, for me, it was an overall poor team performance. You know, I emphasise the word team. The defence coped well until the breakaways happened and then all the backs were found wanting, um, whilst the midfield never looked as if it was competing on, on level terms, let alone dominating. Um, and the attack lacked that sharpness and end product that we've been going on and on about, or at least I have. Um, when I add in the fact that we had 12 corners with no goals to show for it, you have to wonder what has happened to our dead ball training. Uh, so, George, did anyone give you cause for concern or was it just overall a poor performance from the team for you? I think it was, as you rightfully said, it was a poor team performance. Um, I thought Powell and Dunn had some of their worst games for us. I think the, both the fullbacks, um, their wingers kind of had on strings, to be honest. I think it weren't Clark Salter's best game. He lost his marker for the first goal, I think it was. And I think that Field and Colback perhaps were a bit close together in the midfield, so it was quite easy to pass it around them. Uh, I could make a point for everyone not having their greatest game, to be honest. Um, it was just a poor team performance. I think Seller was a bit too deep, didn't press enough. But um, I think it's a bit harsh to criticise him too much when he hasn't had too much service. Um, so I think, yeah, just a poor team performance. I don't think any individual had an 8 out of 10 plus performance. No, and I think, uh, in fact, the media has given the maximum is 7. Uh, and Coley was mm. one of those, by the way. Uh, mm. I, I'm still concerned that Kenneth Powell is not operating at his best. I mean, I think on previews, uh, pre, pre-season ones, he was looking pretty bad as well. Um He's not looking good either going forward or defending. And uh, Mr. Smith seems to be um, the opposite, as he's trying too hard. Um, on the positive side, I thought that Nardi made a crucial save and continues to look calm under pressure. Uh, my heart keeps going, but his is fine, apparently. Um, both uh, Coley and, and Lloyd looked unfazed by the championship opposition they were facing. Uh, and um, Varane uh, looked promising when he came on. Um, any positives for you, George? 
No, I completely agree. I think there were a couple of positives to come out of the game. We had decent, like, even from the start, we had decent spells of good football passing it around them. But as you rightfully said, Varane came on, did really well, I think. I think Lloyd showed a couple of, he looked a bit inexperienced. I'd like to send him out on loan, but he had a couple of moments. And I think, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't the worst performance ever. And you have to read, it was against the West Brom side that, did do well last year. They got some great players in their squad, like John Swift. No one would have thought Magic would have scored a hat trick, but here we are. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, there was a few. I don't think there's any need to overreact with it. I think it's first game of the season. Marty said that um, in preseason he doesn't really look at results, so maybe the players thought of that in the wrong way going into the first game. A bit underprepared, but I think it was good for Anderson to get a goal early on. He only got. Like his first goal was against Leeds last year, wasn't it? In the four nil win, so it was good for him to get a early goal. So yeah, there's certainly some positives to take out of the game. Yeah, it's good. It's good that you mentioned the uh, the goal. Uh, I mean, both Coley and Anderson did well with that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, probably an unfair question is: Can you see after one match? Can you see any difference in the style of play between how we're playing now and how we finished last season? Um, I can't really see too much difference, but I didn't think Marty was going to change it up too much. Um, I did enjoy the football at the back end of last year. I think it was forward thinking. Like anyone who knows me has listened to me. I love football playing out from the back. So I think bringing in Paul Nardi was the perfect thing because rightfully, as you said, we may not be calling the stands about it, but he certainly does. He doesn't, he doesn't break a sweat when he has all these players pressing him. Um, but no, I think... It is good football to watch and it's certainly better than where we were this time last year in terms of the style of play. So I'm never going to complain about Marty's style of football. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's fair enough. Uh, on to the preview. Uh, it's yet another opportunity for our club to gain a bit of revenue through uh, cup attendances. Uh, this is round one of the Caribou Cup and uh, Tuesday 13th of August at uh, 7.45 sees us uh, up at Cambridge United. I did a quick check and found that a few instances of us playing Cambridge. Uh, in 1982, we won a Division 2 match there, 4-1. Um, in 2001, we had a Division 1 match there, uh, which we uh, won 2-1. However, in the reverse fixture, we only drew 0-0. Um, but the latest meeting, the two sides I could find, was the 2021 uh, pre-season friendly, where Chair and Dykes provided the goals in our 2-1 win. Um, which I suppose brings us to current form, uh, dare we say it. Um, in pre-season matches, Cambridge were thumped by Colchester 6-0, lost to Maritimo 2-0, uh, but won their three other matches, including a 1-0 win against the Baggies. Um, in their first match of the season, Cambridge were away at Stockport, coming away 2-0 down at uh, full time. In contrast, QPR won only their <laughs> two matches in Girona, and lost against Spurs, Reading and Brighton. Uh, as you know, we then went on to play our first championship match of the season against West Brom and probably lost that 3-1. So it's almost impossible, I think, to, to judge how this one's going to go, how both sides are going to perform um, when they meet once again. But um, I think the, the oint, fly in the ointment, I guess, is the likely inclusion of non-starting 11 uh, and even development players in the QPR team. So it makes it rather impossible to predict this one, I feel. Um, so, George, the only worthwhile analysis that can be gained from, from this are probably the West Brom match, would you say? Mm, no, I agree. But when you tell me to preview a cup game, I was like, what's the cup? Because we never, we never, we never do well in the cup, and the stats say it. We only made it past the first round once in the last four seasons, losing to teams like Norwich, Cholton, and Plymouth. Um, as as I as I haven't said yet. Um, contrast to Cambridge, who haven't made like haven't not made it to the second round once in five seasons, and that was a loss on penalties last year. So. It's difficult to look into it, isn't it? It's a League One opposition who came 18th last year versus a team who were very forward thinking near the back end of last year. And you just got to look at West Brom and be like, do you play some players to try gain confidence? Do you play some of the youth to try get some first team experience? It's a difficult one, really. But um, I would like to see some players from West Brom get like give a start. Like I'd, I'd like to see Shellas have a start. Hopefully you can get a goal to kickstart it and um, be quite confident.
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on this. Um, yeah, okay, I guess the big question is, do you think Marty's going to go for a win and will therefore put up his strongest side or not? Well, I don't think Marty will ever not go for a win. Like He's not that sort of manager for me. So I think... Um, I don't think the squad will be as strong as we saw against West Brom. I think you'll see the likes of Lloyd playing, Morrison playing, which I'm not against. It'll be good to see them start for the R's. Um But I think, no, he'll certainly go for the win. He'll want to win the game. But any manager will tell you that. So it, it has its pros and cons. We're never going to do too well in the Cup, are we? we? We know that from stats in the past. So get... Obviously, you want to win the game, but not tout gives you less games and everything like that. But you want to win. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, my gut feeling, though, is that we can expect, indeed, the likes of Reggie Cannon, Lyndon Dykes, Liam Morrison, uh, probably even Elijah Dixon Bonner and, and, and Santos to get a game. Um, and he may even start um, um, Salomon in goal. Um, and then, of course, we've got... Benny probably wants a few minutes as well. Then you can add on uh, people like, uh, as you say, Harry Murphy, Taller, and Lloyd. All of those probably deserve the opportunity. Um, so it's a side that I, I think will be composed largely of the unexpected uh, starters, um, but but rather those that will be looking for match sharpness. And, and, and I've got something to prove. I think they'll be trying to say to Marty, don't forget me. Here I am. I, I'm... I'm playing well. Um, the ones I'm particularly interested in seeing for, in getting game time are, are Vranny and um, Lyndon Dykes and, and Elias Chair. If he does turn up, it'll be a miracle if he does actually turn up. But I don't think he's there yet um, because we need them as match fit as, as soon as possible. Really do. Um, the club had its ticket allocation sold out very quickly. Uh, did this surprise you, George? Uh, in a way. E midweek evening fixture in round one of the Caribou Cup was being so well supported? Well, usually with any other team, I'd say it surprised you. But with our support, for especially last year, it does not surprise me at all. Like the, the away support, the home support has been incredible. Like you look at Loftus Road on Saturday, it was packed out. I think the attendance was just over 17,000 it was recorded. So, um, yeah, you can't, you can't fault the fans. The fans have backed the team throughout, so I'm really not shocked. No, that's, that, that's good that you say that. Um, uh, I guess it's it's therefore the time for you to sort of uh, commit yourself. Prediction time. Given our woeful cup record, as you've quite rightly pointed out uh, in these past seasons, are we going to win this round one fixture? Uh, and if so, what do you think the score is going to be? Well, I'm always known for being a bit of a positive, so I think we will win. Um, I, I was deciding here whether a 1-0 QPR win or a win on penalties um, but I've gone with the 1-0 I think we'll score later on in the game so yeah I'm going for a 1-0 victory I think I think we're going to win that's really interesting okay as I mentioned we've got an abysmal track record uh, in cup matches in re not even in recent times in, in, in most times that probably you as George can re ever remember um, <laughs> we we've tended not to field our best players uh, treating cup matches at times as a B, B team run out uh, or worrying about uh, protecting the, the uh, starting eleven uh, because we're in such a dire position in the league. Uh, whereas lower division sides, quite rightly, see us as a scalp worth taking. That said, uh, I'm also going for a narrow 1-0 win. So uh, if we both say this, it probably won't come about at all. Um, <laughs> so uh, let, let's move on to some club news, if we may. Um, our supposed quest to sign a, a, a on loan, the left winger Raki uh, Saki uh, from Palace, was hijacked by Sheffield United. I'm glad about that because it's quite a mouthful. Um, was that a disappointing outcome for you, uh, George? It's disappointing because you'd like to see him at QPR, and I think it would have been a good move for him because um, Palace and QPR have some good links with the SA thing and stuff like that. But I think you look at the deal that I think Sheffield United are preparing to make, and it's ridiculous. It includes a one million loan fee. They're mm -hmm. playing. They're paying three times what his wages are at the moment. Like it's quite interesting. They Palace actually rejected a fifteen million pound bid today, supposedly from Leeds for him. Um, so he's quite a wanted man, but. You can see with the finances that Palace are demanding, why would you do that when you can find someone else um, 
for a much cheaper price. And who knows, this guy's never played in the championship before. He's looked good for Palace in pre-season, did well for Cholton in League One. But for that sort of money, it's way too much of a risk for a loan. Yeah, I'm with you on that, I must admit. Um, the squad numbers when they were allocated this week, uh, numbers two and number seven were left vacant. Uh, do you think this was a statement of intent by Marty, George, or do you think it's just that someone's not very good with their number work? I think it does show who they are targeting and who they're trying to bring in. I don't think you can ever look too much into squad numbers, but seven definitely brings in a winger for me. I think you could look into maybe 14 being Isaac Hayden's number last year, maybe look for a loan back for him. But um, no, I don't look too much into squad numbers, but it could be a statement of intent. Well, there's a, a guy that's buzzing around at the moment on the media speculation, which is Koki Saito. Um, and he already on uh, Sussex R's, uh, they've given him the nickname of Hokey for some strange reason, Hokey Koki. Um, um, he is uh, contracted to Lommel in Belgium and he's a Japanese winger. By the sound of it, you could probably tell that. Um, and apparently it was a revelation over the last two seasons at, uh, at Sparta Rotterdam. Uh, when when he's fully fit, apparently he's a really good ta tra no. talent. Um, and also a really good dribbler, knife for the goal, all the, all the stuff that we really want. Um, and he's working from uh, the, the wide positions. I, I, I think he sounds really exciting. Does he sound good to you? No, 100%. He sounds exactly what we need. 20 goals and assists in two seasons for Sparta Rotterdam, mm. I think it was. And it's good. He's um He looks like a creative player. He doesn't really look like the sort of pacey player that you maybe want to bring in, a young pace uh, pacemaker. But he, he looks good. Good creativity. Um, Looks like he's got good finishing. Like I've, I've seen some Sparta Rotterdam comment. He said that he puts them on the edge of their seats. And that's all you can really ask for at QPR, isn't it? And I think it's what we've been what we've been needing because you look at it chair not being in the squad we really do lack that attacking spark so i think if you can bring him in it's a great sign and it's an exciting signing because i've said it on other places we're not just signing the same old journeyman from championship and league one no one's ever heard of him before like if if you say you have you're lying uh <laughs> so um no it's really good and it's exciting it looks very exciting to me okay well fingers crossed on hokey then hmm. okay uh, the other one that's come up uh, in the rumour mill um, just in the last few days has been uh, Karamoko Dembele. I mean, the Dembele name certainly is well known to everybody. Mm. Uh, I mean, West London Sport was saying that uh, QPR have agreed a fee of around 2.2 million, um, which sounds, you know, we started to talk money, serious money here. It sounds as if something is really happening. Um, apparently, they've been trying to sign him for a while and uh, they see him as a probably as a direct replacement for Chris Willock. Uh, would you think that's the case? No, I completely agree. And I think it'd be an improvement on Willock in some ways. Um, right. You look at 21 goals and assists in one season in League One last year. And I remember when he was at Celtic at 16, everyone was saying he was the next wonder kid and everything like that. So yeah. once again, it's another exciting one. He's still only 21 years of age. Um, but I can't remember the last time he spent that sort of money on a player. Um it's crazy. It is crazy. We certainly haven't for the last few seasons. So it is that is certainly a statement of intent if we can get that one through. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I, I'm quite excited about that one, if it happens. Um, let's move on to injuries. Um, even though okay. Dykes has made a welcome return from his injury, we're still without Chair or Fox, as they seem to be struggling with their injuries. Given that Fox is uh, Powell's understudy, and Chair has to be seen as a game changer up front. How serious do you think is their continued absence? Oh, I think it's very serious. You look at it, especially Ilias Chair. Like mm. I've I've said it on this before. When Chair plays well, the team seems to play well. And um, if you're lacking that creativity, like you look at it, Collie did well, but he's 18 years of age. You cannot put that sort of pressure on a player again. We learned that with Armstrong. Mm. Um, so no, I think Chair missing's probably the biggest one. Fox, he. He's sitting around the bench anyway, but it certainly does give you that cover, especially if Powell's having a good, uh, sorry, a bad game. Um, and I think he does give you that outlet ball as well. You look at it with Jimmy Dunn. If Nardi can't play it out from the back, he usually hits it towards that side for a flick on header. So if, if the game weren't going your way, you could bring on Fox for that. 
So I think they are two significant players you are missing, but especially the chair one, he just gives you that spark, doesn't he? And when some people take him for granted when he's in your team, but when he's not there, wow, you can really see the difference. Yeah, I'm with you on that, 100%. Um, I mean, how long do you think it will take them to get match fit when they finally are appearing on the, the bench? Oh, well, it's hard to look into. Chair did appear in some of the friendlies in Girona, didn't he? So, you look, and Marty said he's been doing his individual plan as well. So, you'd like to think it wouldn't take too long. And mm. his sort of character, he's not one to sit on the bench for a while, is he? So, he'll want to get playing. And then Fo Fox is a difficult one, really, because he hasn't really had the best injury record in the past, I don't think. He's been out with some sort of long-term injury. So, I think it will take them a few games to get up to... Stat uh, get up to um, match fitness and that's why I think the transfers are key if you can bring in some of them creative players like Dembele or Sato people like that it will put less pressure on chair to get back quicker yeah I 100% agree with that of course um I, I agree that also that that chair is that spark that additional spark that we need um once we get the ball finally through the midfield uh or, or up via the wings Chair uh, interacting with uh, those up front, it makes all the difference in the world. It really does. So get well soon, Ilias. We miss you. Uh, right. You really do. <laughs> all that remains is for me to thank George for his time and opinions, both of which are truly valued by me. Um, thank you, thank you. And thank those of you who are making that trek up to Cambridge to support the club that we love. And lastly, to let you know that James and Dave will be previewing Saturday's game against the Blades. Uh, so it's just come on, you ours from both of us. Come on, you ours. We know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR. I am